Welcome to That Season Air podcast. I'm your host Gina. Stick with me as I chat to Season Airs, expats and adventurers across the world sharing their inspiring stories and interesting insights into living and working abroad. On today's show, I catch up with summer season air and fellow podcaster, Sandy Clunas. I've never dealt very well with authority, so I think it was just that. I think and he was like, right, well, if you're going to be a little shit, I'm going to give you a stupid job. And he gave me a stupid job. (laughs) (laughs) Having completed several seasons as a windsurf instructor in Greece, Sandy came in to tell us how season work not only shaped his passion and expertise, but led him to sponsorship opportunities and ultimately scored him a position commentating on the Freestyle Pro Tour. Tune in as we get some deep insight into the skills and opportunities that come with season life. Sandy shares the highs and lows of his journey and the inspiration behind starting his men's mental health podcast, The After Hours Lounge. And stick with us right to the end of the show as we get fired up about that notorious question we've all been asked, when you're going to get a real job? Just a quick note, we do get pretty deep in this one, so a quick warning to anyone who may be triggered by conversations surrounding mental health. And without further ado, here's the show. Sandy Clueless, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a privilege, a privilege to have a fellow podcaster on the show. Technically, the sound should be great on this, but we'll yeah. see. This should, be the, this should be the best produced podcast of all time, shouldn't it? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> if not, I'll take the blame. I'll take the full blame. Oh, yeah, this, is, this one's your fault. This one's definitely your fault. Yeah, this is on me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally and what is your current situation? What are you up to? So I am from the Highlands of Scotland. My dad's from there. We moved up there when I was eight years old and I kind of grew up there. And I did a bit of, you know, like primary school, you finish and you go away for a week. To We went away to a place called Lock Inch, which is very, very famous kind of water sports centre in the Highlands of Scotland. And it's right in the Cairn Gorms in the mountains as well. And they, they do all sorts. And I did a little bit of windsurfing there and I touched on it a bit throughout being a kid. And I was like, I was always like, yeah, I'm the surfer dude at school. Yeah. And I had blonde hair and, you know, and we went on a, we went on a few, you know, like the sort of sun sail holidays and things like that. So it, it was always in my mind, like, oh, pe- people go and do these cool things. They go and live abroad and teach sports and stuff for a few months. And I was like, that looks like a lot of fun. And I mean, I, yeah, I sound very privileged saying all this, but we went to the, we went to the Caribbean on holiday and I, I sort of did a bit of windsurfing and this sunset holiday. And at the end of it, I kind of won. I can't remember what it was I won, but they gave me a foot strap from a board. Okay. And they were like, here you go, take this home. And I took it home and I was like, oh, yeah, windsurfing and all this. <laughs> and then I basically didn't touch windsurfing. I got a bit too cool for school and was, you know, drinking strongbow in the park with my friends and like everyone does when you're 16 Mm -hmm. and then and then got to end last year of school and finished and all this and I was like I'm not going to uni so I thought oh well I'll go and I'll go and do seasons instead oh cool so it was kind of since school you were like automatically I'm getting out of here and going windsurfing oh yeah 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 no no I, I to the point where my in Scotland you don't really go to college you can kind of stay at school till you're sort of 18 okay so I did that and I remember halfway through my last year of school, I realized that this was what I was going to do. So I dropped a couple of subjects and basically my last year of school turned into like my gap year. Like I got a job at a hotel down the road and I was going to school for like two hours a day and just pissing around. And it was brilliant. But (laughs) yeah, I I made up my mind really early. You know, I hadn't I hadn't even turned 18 yet. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah, that was so I'm 30. I I turned 30 last August. So, yeah, that was 12, 12, 13 years ago now. And then my last season was 2017, so five years ago now. But I still spend every summer in Greece. And now I started my own business just under three years ago. And I work remotely from wherever I want. And I realized I was like, just because I've finished doing seasons, I've not finished with that lifestyle. And I think that's where a lot of season airs like struggle with so much. If they've had this lifestyle mm-hmm. for so many years, and then they're like, how do I, how do I kind of find that happy medium of like, of, you know, going to the next step, realizing perhaps maybe I, you know, I don't want to work behind a, and I'm not taking anything away from any of this, by the way, but, you know, I I don't want to just be, you know, be a pot wash in the mountains or something. I'd like to, well, you know, whether it's progress and maybe earn a bit more money and start a business, but also I want to be able to go and ski and snowboard three hours a day or windsurf or whatever it is you love doing. You want to keep that lifestyle. So that's, 
that's what I've been really trying to do over the last few years. Obviously, you know, having to coincide with COVID starting, but <laughs> we're not going to talk too much about COVID, hopefully, because it's so boring. But but yeah, that's <laughs> that's what I've been that's what I've been trying to do, and that that's kind of what I've been up to recently is is trying to keep that season air lifestyle, but in the I, I fucking hate people calling it the real world, but I can't think of what else to call it at the moment. Yeah. But you know, outside of the season air bubble, but maintaining the lifestyle. That's the best way of saying it. And what is it that you do? Essentially like marketing. So freelance social media management. Obviously, uh, you know, you said at the beginning, I, I do my own podcast stuff. So I've, I've helped a couple of businesses, mm-hmm. you know, start starting podcasts, things like that. A bit of everything, you know, when it comes to like, you know, marketing and I suppose being creative and like copywriting, stuff like that. Anything that can be done from a laptop, you know, perfect somewhere nice. Yeah. You're a bit different, actually, to all of my guests, I think, that have been on the podcast in the way that you've only done summer seasons. You haven't done any winter seasons. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, I was I was nervous. I was nervous about this, Gina, because I was like, am I going to be judged by all your listeners and, and yourself? Because Yeah, yeah. No, I, no. I've, I've never done. I've never done a winter season. No, I, I, um, I finished my first summer season and I had applied and had got I had a job at there used to be like the big nielsen hotel in one of the alps resorts Mm -hmm. and i'd been offered a job there okay but then i got a job as a windsurfing instructor in australia instead and i was like well i can i can go be a waiter in a hotel in france or i can go and live in australia and continue teaching and and doing that and so then i i did that and then after that i kind of just got the bug for windsurfing and was like no i'm I'm gonna pour all my focus into this instead right i don't know I, i don't regret it but I would, I would have maybe liked to have experienced what the kind of winter season thing was like. I've got a few really close friends who did quite a few winters and we're planning, you know, obviously next winter, we, you know, we want to go on a trip and I'd like to learn to snowboard and stuff because um, I, think, I think it'd be really cool. Yeah, no, I found that really interesting. That, and it's good, actually, because it is the run up to summer and you're going to be the last episode of season two. Awesome. So it's going to be coming out pretty soon. Yep. And yeah, it might give people some idea of what to do during the summer. So I want to hear your story. I want to hear how you went about it. Where did you go and all the rest of it? I, I went about it in a fairly unique way. As I said, I... I'd finished school, but I was in the Highlands of Scotland. I wasn't in a resort place. I didn't live abroad as mm-hmm. a kid or anything like that. So whilst I could perhaps stand on a board and lift a sail up, I, I wasn't by any chance a, a good windsurfer. I didn't know what I was doing, anything like that. So when I realized that was what I wanted to do, um, I found a company called Flying Fish who do instructor training courses, kind of zero to hero, basically. I, I know there's a lot of kind of ski and snowboard companies that do similar yeah. things, I think. And so you you basically go and you 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 live uh somewhere bloody nice and hot and sunny and 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 they train you in six weeks to go from having never done it before to being uh what they call a star instructor so you can teach beginner windsurfing right so i i worked at a petrol station in my little town in the highlands of scotland and i saved up for nine months and then i moved to australia i did a 12-week course to become a windsurfing and sailing instructor and flying fish have such a great reputation in the industry that often big kind of tour operator companies like Nielsen, Sunsail, you know, Mark Warner, those kind of things would actually offer you a job before you've even done your course. You know, so they offer you the job going, right, yeah, if you passed your course, everything like that, you've got a job with us for the summer. Nice. And and that was what happened with me for um, for Nielsen. So I went to Australia uh, January 2010. And by February 2000, I had an interview two weeks before I went to Australia with Nielsen. I had to go down to Glasgow and, you know, go and sit there and chat and and all this and yeah it was it was very <laughs> casual and very chilled which was really cool for me because I'm I'm not a smart person in any sense of the word <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I uh yeah went in and, and did that and then I went to Australia and, and yeah within a couple of weeks of being in Australia I, I got the thing saying yeah we'd, we'd love to send you to um a resort called Porta Heli which is on the mainland in Greece cool so yeah I did my thing in Australia I became a windsurf instructor then I did the second six weeks I became a sailing instructor as well so I did like the multi I thought it'd be a good idea to be qualified in both. And I still, at that point, I still wasn't, I wasn't fully into windsurfing. I was just like, oh, I just want to become a water sports instructor. Right. The love of that particular sport came about a year later, I suppose. So I went to, went to Port Heli. It was a very, it's quite a big resort. You know, a lot, I imagine what a lot of people think of when they see a summer season place, a lot of kids, you know, every activity you can think of a huge hotel with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of rooms and tennis courts up at the back and, you know, a, a pontoon with there was like yacht flotillas coming in and out and things like that. And in all honesty, 
you know, looking back, I'm like, well, I wouldn't have wanted to do a season there now or anything like that. But it was the perfect place to do my first yeah. season. I think you kind of start to realise uh, as humans as well, but, you know, specifically the season, you start to figure out certain aspects that you enjoy. Mm-hmm. You know, some people like some people uh, like a real party resort. Some people are, are in it for the core, like, no, we want to go. I want to go windsurfing or I want to go, uh, you know, snowboarding or whatever. They're in it, you know, for that. Mm-hmm. But the, the Porta Heli was a real all round resort. It wasn't very windy, so there was nothing hectic about it. It was, you know, very relaxed. Um, it was a big team, so there was a lot of people I could learn from, but there was also an awful lot of first people doing their first season as well. Um, actually, another another guy who I did my course with in Australia got the same job, so we ended up going from Australia oh, to Greece cool. together. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. And and at, at the time I was there, I kind of became aware of this like wider world of seasons. It's very easy, you know, going on holiday when you're a kid and looking at it or even going on holiday as an adult and looking yeah. at it. But once you're suddenly on the other side as an instructor, you you see the other side of it. <laughs> yeah. You see the staff accommodation. You see the fact that you get paid 300 quid a month and live on pesto pasta. You see the, <laughs> you see the right, boys, you've all got to go and stand at the bar. And the more people you talk to about tillers and rudders and sails, the more people are going to buy you beers for free. <laughs> yeah. You start to work. You start to work out the ecosystem a little bit, and it was awesome to have a place like that to navigate those waters. Mm-hmm. You know, no pun intended. You know, me and <laughs> me and sort of three or four of the boys who were all doing our first season. We were all eighteen years old, and we're all like, right, well, let's let's just go and figure this out. And we are, and we were the, you know, you are the kind of cool guys with a tan, and you've got really blonde hair, and all the everyone wants to talk to you and things like that. You know. Yeah. And, and I, I just f- fell straight into that and, and loved it. And I've always been very chatty and, and outgoing. So for me, it was like, I was like, the cat's got the cream. You yeah, know, I was, nice. having a gr- <laughs> I was having a great time. And, and luckily, um, I met some some of the boys that I did my season with that year. I'm, I'm still really good friends with now. I think that's a remarkable thing about seasons as well is if we'd met outside of seasons, we would not have been friends or anything like that. But as soon as you're thrown into the proverbial trenches together, suddenly you become like <laughs> like everyone you know if you have a job at home you always have like work mates but you never really hang out with them outside of work but when you do a season you hang out with them all the time because you're probably sharing a room with them you're sharing accommodation with them and you have to socialize with them because there's no one else to socialize with so you do form these kind of relationships that are and romantic relationships can be said about this as well you know it, it's like five years of a relationship happen in three months Fr- friendships and romances and there's something awesome about it. There's also probably something quite dysfunctional about it, especially when it comes to the romance <laughs> side of it. But no, it, it, it was um, it was a really great place. And then towards the middle of that season, I like I said, there was, you know, you find out about the wider world. And I was like, oh, there's there's all these other Nielsen resorts around Greece and Turkey and this. And, mm-hmm. and they're talking about a couple of them and how windy they are and how good they are for windsurfing. And as I was about halfway through that season, I was like, well, yeah, everyone thinks windsurfing is the cool sport, including me. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'd like to start getting better. So and I'm really proud of my 18 year old self for doing this. I went and spoke to my manager, a guy called Alex, who I don't know, hopefully you're listening to this, Alex, but you're an absolute hero. And it was amazing. He was the best boss for my first season. He was very tolerant of all the stupid things I did. But I went and said to him, I said, look, if they need someone at any of these like really windy resorts, could could I go for a couple of weeks if they need an extra pair of hands or whatever, if you can spare me, can can I go and get, you know, and Alex was like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, kind of, yeah, sure, whatever. And then as we got towards the end of that season, he, he kind of called me in and said, well, right, there's a place called Vasiliki. And he said, the Nielsen resort there, it's, it's a much smaller resort. It's very windsurf oriented. They don't do any, any sailing instruction. They don't do anything else. It's literally a hotel and windsurfing. Wow. And he said, do you want to go for a couple of weeks? And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so yeah, I got on a bus for like seven hours and went there. And I remember arriving in Bass and there was hundreds of windsurfers out. And it was so windy, like windier than I'd ever seen Port Heli be. And I was like, I'm in a different, and I arrived and walked through the hotel and it was really open. And immediately I saw someone come in and kind of try a trick. And I was like, I've never seen anyone try a trick windsurfing before. Oh, cool. I was like, again, my eyes just opened even more. Yeah. And and in those two weeks, I was like, right, I've got to work my ass off here, prove myself to this this manager here. 
and also I was like, I just, I just spent all my time windsurfing. I was like, I, I and I, again, I look back and I, I was like, it's very responsible for 18 year old Sandy <laughs> to do this. I actually, I was nine, I just turned 19 by the time I went there, but you know, I, I didn't go and realize, oh, there's loads more girls here and parties and all this. I was like, no, I'm, I'm here for a reason. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to really smash this. And, and I, and I did, and I spent every single season in Vass after that really? for the rest of my season. Okay. Hey, we'll get we'll get that bit over with now. That's about as interesting as my career ever got. Um, no, that's awesome. You obviously found somewhere that you really loved. I so. did, yeah, I, I did, mm-hmm. and I, I I find there's parallels like that with with pe- my friends who have done winter seasons as well. Is they find one resort, they find a resort, and they go right. Well, I, I'm going to stay here, and and that's what I did, and. And I didn't feel like I was missing out. And I had friend, you know, and to Nielsen, every single windsurfing instructor wants to work in, in, in Bass. It was very much the resort for windsurfing and things like that. So for me to get a job there, I felt very privileged. So I ended up going on to do two more seasons for Nielsen in Bass. And then I left Nielsen and went to work for a, another company in Bass called Club Bass as well, which is the biggest, biggest windsurfing center in Europe. Mm-hmm. And I did five seasons there. What was the difference in working for the other company then? obviously it's the biggest windsurf center in europe they're kind of the best of the best they've got everything's brand new every year they've got very special relationships with all the brands quite a few of the instructors were our pros um and compete on the world tour and club vast would sponsor them and and all this and they they very much focus on the the staff are very much encouraged to hang out with the guests a lot more and it's a lot less seasons you come across this weird thing called enforced fun where they try and <laughs> you know they, they do right you know we're going to do cocktails and canapes tonight and you have to show up in your blues and twos and talk to guests and stuff and club bass didn't focus on that it was they'd fostered this like vibe where everyone wanted to be there there wasn't like a right the staff are finished and they can go home and they really they had this reputation of you know they've got the most advanced instructors in any windsurf center in the world and things like that and for me at the time you know, a couple of years after my first season, I was like obsessed with windsurfing and I was very much like, right. And, and I'd started to learn some freestyle and was like, right, this is, this is the road I want to go down. So if I'm going to do that, then I want to be in the best center in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I got, I got to know the guys there. And fortunately I I lived out in Egypt for two of the winters. Like I said, I, I followed the sun. So I went out to Egypt rather than doing winter seasons. And I got to know Club Vass also had a center out there. Nielsen, my first year, Nielsen did as well. So I ended up working there. But I, I just got to know them all really well. And and yeah, and then and, and, and that was it, really. The, re- the rest is history, I suppose. And now I'm lucky, lucky enough to, you know, a lot of the, the instructors and stuff that work there who I looked up to, you know, when I was working at Nielsen, I was like, who are these guys doing these tricks and all this? And <laughs> and now they're some of my best friends. And as I said at the start, I I spend July and August there every year now you know, staying at, uh, well, not staying at Club Vast, but, you know, hanging out there and windsurfing from there and, mm-hmm. and, and things like that. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very different resort. And it's small, it's small in that there's no, it, it's not a big chain, I suppose. Um, you know, there's not, they've not got 10, 15 resorts and having to keep an eye on this. So they're so singularly focused that every detail is taken care of in that one resort, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so you said that, you went to Egypt in between seasons. Was that every season or was that just some of the time? So my, my first winter as a seasonaire, I suppose, I went back to Australia and taught windsurfing at the, the centre there. And then the following three winters, I, I lived in Egypt. Okay, cool. And so I did Vasiliki in Greece and then Dahab in Egypt. I just did that solidly for, for three years. It was a bit unfortunate with Egypt. Every year I went, it got less and less busy. Okay. There was a few geopolitical things going on and you know the the last year we were there there was a bit of a terrorist attack a couple of hours up the road and oh, everyone kind of freaked out so every center sort of closed its doors and stuff and all the you know foreign tour operators all pulled out of Egypt basically right it's actually only just opening back up now there's a lot you know the easyjet opened there obviously I think covid delayed it as well but easyjet have now opened their flights back up to Sharm el Sheikh and you can go there again now i think it's going to pick back up because it's an amazing place but yeah, the first year I went, I worked for uh, Nielsen on and off. You know, I, it's such a cheap place. So I kind of just went and hung out and just windsurfed with a load of mates as well. So we went and did that. And then we'd pick up like a week or two's work. You know, if they had a busy week or a big group coming over for windsurf lessons, we'd all, you know, jump in and teach. So I did that for Nielsen. And then I did that for the Club Bass Centre out there. And I think I made a good impression again. And they kind of said, right, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, 
yeah, do you want to come and work with us in Greece kind of thing, you know? I think that that's, I mean, maybe I'm jumping a bit ahead, but that's one of the biggest things I would say to anybody wanting to do a, do a season or anything like that. Like realize that it is a job and that you, there are always people to impress. And if you just say yes, if they go, oh, do you want to, do you want to work for a couple of days? And yeah, it might get in the way of you not being able to go and get shit faced with your friends that night. But like <laughs> for, for me, if I'd said no to a couple of those things, I, I wouldn't have had the season air career I did have. And I think that that's such a big thing is you, whilst it's fun and you know it is a bit of a a piss up and messing around and things like it is a career and you are you're you know you're these people are coming out every week and you want to give them the best week of their lives and stuff and if you look at it like that just a little bit you know you can still go out and get pissed and have fun but by by just going do you know what i am going to view this as a as a job and i'm going to take it a little bit seriously you can get some amazing opportunities. And I was very, very lucky that I, I found those opportunities. But I, I'm perhaps going to be a bit egotistical and I will put it down to, I did kind of work for it a bit. I did sort of say, you know, everyone else is lying on the beach and going windsurfing when they want. But I was like, no, I'll, I'll take a week's work. Yeah, I'll take a week's work and I'll, I'll, I'll go and teach these people while all my mates are off windsurfing in the lagoon around there. I'll take these beginners out every morning for the next five days. And I was like, yeah. But then that got me a that got me a job at this amazing center and all, all these other, other, other opportunities. So that, that's one thing I will say, I don't want to sound too preachy or like, you know, the old man at the bar going back in my day. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that, that is one thing, one thing that I will say about my, my season air experience. Yeah. With the club vas, I guess you have the same thing as Nielsen where you have kind of already have that network of people to kind of hang about with and socialize with and things like that. Is that the case? Vasiliki specifically has, uh sort of four or five centers along the uh, in one bay along the beach so there was uh, uh, nielsen another company called uh ocean elements that what alpine elements was their winter uh, program not sure if you heard of them but yeah, uh, so there was that then there was a, a german center called human sports then there was club bass and then there was a, a high performance uh sailing dinghy sailing center they are called wild wind as well and then there was another greek center just up the road so uh, and each one of them would have loads of staff, you know, mostly mostly British. You know, obviously the the German centre would have sort of four or five instructors. It was much smaller, but the, most of them obviously would be would be German. A couple of um, English ones, but uh, mostly it was a lot of British people. And to be honest, the first couple of years I was there, it was pretty tribal. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was pretty tribal, and you know, club club bass had a bit of a reputation as kind of being a bit egotistical and a bit unwilling to hang out with the other resorts and, okay. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Nielsen and kind of Ocean Elements would hang out with each other a little bit and we were a bit more similar and then you couldn't hang out with Club Vasque. They were too cool for us. And then, <laughs> and then, and then Wild Wind, the sailing center, they did a lot of stuff with Club Vasque. So they were kind of friends, but also because they were sailors, they kind of kept themselves to themselves a bit. And did you notice any changes with that at all? Uh, ma massively yeah again it, it was an odd one when i made the changeover so i when i went over from um from nielsen to club vast i think because i'd done that winter in egypt and i kind of met them all and even before that the first winter i spent in egypt between my nielsen seasons a guy came out and lived with us who actually worked at club bass and is now is now my best friend ed oh cool and we ended up hanging out and we were like we are literally the same person. Like why, <laughs> you you know, you realize like, why, why do we think each other are arseholes? Like mm -hmm. just because you work in a different center. And so I feel like my second season at Nielsen, because I knew a couple of the guys from Egypt, we kind of went down a bit more and hung out with them a bit more. And mm -hmm. I'd kind of realized like, oh, you know, I, I'm not saying I led the charge, but also that year at Nielsen, there was a particularly big group of, us who were all very into windsurfing and we'd all we all learned a few tricks and stuff and i think we i think that gave us a bit more brownie points a bit more respect maybe so we would go down and, and people you know the the club bass staff would come and chat to us and all this and i think it's one of those things where perhaps um because you don't work at club bass and club bass is known to be the best one you kind of get a bit waspy that like, well, well, we're, we're good too. And actually <laughs> you realize, you realize that none of the actual animosity ever came from club bass. It perhaps came from a slight bit of frustration and an almost jealousy of like, why aren't we as good as them? Yeah. You know? And then, and then for me making the transition going down to club bass, I kind of realized why and it, it was purely just ingrained into the culture of the the center and the the hotel and everything. It was just a different vibe and, but I remember everyone always used to say, "Oh no, it's only young people that go to Club Bass, and you know, none of none of they're they're all just there to party and things like that." And 
And I got there and I was like, hang on, these are all families. They're still the same old kind of mid 50s onwards, older men dragging their wives out on a windsurf holiday so they can go sailing for two weeks. And they're, you know, I was like, these clientele are no different, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. There was a couple more university groups that would come out because Club Bass, but again, that was because Club Bass supported the Student Windsurfing Association in the UK. Okay. So I was like, well, Nielsen don't do that. Yeah. You know, and like, like I said, Club Bass, I think we're just way more ingrained in the, the windsurfing industry and culture. And I think maybe that uh, other centers perhaps got a bit frustrated with it. Also, there was the the fact that you had, you know, essentially pro windsurfers working there as instructors and that the level of instructor there and the lev their personal level of windsurfing. It would be like, uh, uh, windsurfing is obviously a much smaller sport, but it's like having, you know, Sean White or, Billy Morgan teaching you how to snowboard. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I think it did rub people up. But then I think there started to be a bit more of an effort on the Friday night when we would have our big party barbecue at Club Vass. A couple of the instructors, I was kind of one of them because I'd worked at Nielsen before and things. So we'd walk up the beach every Friday afternoon and say, hey guys, do you want to come, you know, come down to our party and all this? And I think it got much better. To, and, and then now it's almost completely, you know, everyone hangs out together now yeah so it's great to see because a couple of us as well had had done seasons at nielsen so whereas i think the generation before me were very you know they'll live and die by the sword for club vast but i think ultimately you just got to realize that we are literally all there for the same reason you're all there to be a season air and live in the sun and and have a good time um and it doesn't matter what color your uniform is <laughs> you know yeah, that's very true so what are some highlights from vast tell us about the place like we always say, like there there is just something in the air. It's a very small fishing village. It's kind of like a horseshoe bay. There's some world class mountain biking on on the island that it's on. It's on an island called Lefkada, which is northwest of Greece. It, it's unbelievable mountain biking, and then the windsurfing. It's a thermal wind, so sort of two three o'clock every day the wind starts, and then it just gets windier and windier up until about seven eight o'clock, and then it dies. It's just the perfect place for windsurfing. You, you've you got these kind of light winds in the morning. So you go out and you teach your beginners and blah, blah, blah. And then in the afternoon, everyone goes and has lunch. And then in the afternoon, suddenly this, this wind starts and it just sort of picks up and up and up throughout the afternoon. Mm -hmm. you, you can kind of teach everyone in stages, you know, like the advanced guys will sit around until five o'clock. Then they'll go, you know, it's, you know, the, all the restaurants in town are amazing and all the local guys, I imagine this is the same for you in, you know, in Austria and stuff, but all the, local guys that that um work in all the restaurants and stuff they all windsurf as well cool. you know and, yeah yeah or, or or if they don't windsurf they're like my restaurant exists because of this sport and because of all these people coming here and all this so there's, there's just a vibe it's a really small local town in a re on a really small island yeah and there's such a little vibe about the place something i've thought about is that when people are in bass you're, you're always meeting the best self of someone mm -hmm. because they're really happy that they're there you know, they're like, I'm in my, I'm in my happy place. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm definitely the best version of Sandy when I'm there. That's for sure. That's so cool. Is that what keeps you coming back to Bass? Well, I mean, the big thing that kept me going back was the fact that Club Bass only had that center and I wanted to remain with that company. In between those seasons, I would go to, diff I would do different trips abroad and then I would go back to Scotland and, and work. I actually worked in a leisure center for like three years in oh, between okay. seasons. So I'd, I'd go and work there for a month or two. Then I'd go on a trip somewhere windsurfing. And then I'd come back, work for another month at the leisure center. And then it would be time for summer to start. And a lot of us kind of, you know, did that. So I kind of felt like I got my fill of going to other places during the winter. And then in the summer, I was like, I, and maybe, maybe it was kind of um, tunnel vision of me. And, you know, but looking back on you know, now I'm 30, I look back on my 20s as a whole and I'm like, I honestly wouldn't have wanted to spend it any other way. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, I don't regret not going to other places in the summer. And, and, and every other season air you spoke to would be like, oh, I really want to do a season of us. Really want to do a season of us. And then, you know, there was a few Nielsen resorts that weren't that far away from Vast. There was one called Civita, which is kind of, you know, two and a half hours away. There was one called Funaki, which was an hour and a half away. And loads of the staff from those resorts would come down on their day off to windsurf. Ah, okay. So I'm like, you guys are coming here on your day off. <laughs> Must and I'm be doing good. A sea yeah, and I'm doing a season here. So I'm like, why? Well, I don't need to go anywhere <laughs> else, mate. Yeah. You know, and it, once you once I realized that, and, and I realized that early on, like I said, you know, my, in my first season when I wasn't even in Vass, I'd heard about this place and I went and I went and did those, you know, two weeks of working there and straight away I was there and I was like, well, I get it. I get it. 
I get why everyone loves it here. And I, and it's just the wind, you, you know, like the funny thing is, you know, it's a bit like people opening a ski resort somewhere where it doesn't snow that much. Like a lot of these windsurf big hotels, these Nielsen things, they don't want it to be that windy because it's hard to manage 150, 200 people out windsurfing in, in a lot of wind at one time. You know, there's a lot of risks there and there's a lot of safety and things like that. And it wasn't aimed at the high performance side of the sport. Whereas Club Vast very much was. So I was like, well, that, that's where I want to be. I want to be in amongst it. And I want to be able to go windsurfing myself. Yeah, you yeah. know, they have a, a, an amazing rotation system so that you could go and get out on the water yourself during the day, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, for sure. That's so important. A, a lot of other season air places. If anyone's listening from Nielsen or Mark Warner or anywhere else, let your fucking staff go windsurfing <laughs> or skiing or snowboarding or whatever it is they like doing. They're going to be much happier and they're going to be much more willing to talk to guests if you let them go and do it. <laughs> just just figure it out. Literally figure it out. It's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> With Club Vass, it was like, cool, let's, let's work out a rotation system so that every member of staff will get at least one 40 minute rotation to go windsurfing. But I've worked in resorts as well where the manager strolls down and goes, right, yeah, looks good. I'm going out, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, that's not, that's not how you do it. Let them eat first and then you can eat. Yeah. You know, you've got, you've got a lead from the front and that, that always really annoyed me. And then that was something amazing about Club Bass as well, that both my beach managers and then Ollie, the hotel manager as well, would never windsurf until everybody else had first. You know, they'd always be like, you you guys go and I'll I'll catch one at the end. I'll catch a session at the end of the day. By my first season there, I'd done three seasons elsewhere. So I kind of knew what I didn't want, you know, and I, I found everything I wanted there. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. So that I, that was another reason why I was like, well, why why would I move? Why would I leave? You know, and anyone listening as well, I, this is not me um, shitting on Nielsen in the slightest. Mm -hmm. Like I absolutely loved my seasons there. I had an amazing time, especially for like my formative years. Like I said, that first season in Port Heli. That was where I cut my teeth. You know, that was where I learned everything. I learned to be an instructor there. Um, Nielsen flew me to another one of their resorts and put me through my intermediate instructor course. Yeah. You know, they were doing doing one for a load of instructors from different resorts. You know, it was it was amazing. And I, I did have a great few seasons there, but I enjoy working at Club Ass way more, yeah. obviously. It sounds awesome. Yeah. They've got their shit together by the sounds of it. Well, that's, that's it. But it, I think it's purely down to they've got one resort and Nielsen have got 15. You know, it's it's far easier to iron out the creases in one resort than 15 resorts where you've got hundreds and hundreds of staff. But um, my my main gripe and the only thing I would say, if, they, if you put me in Nielsen head office right now, I would say this to them. Mm -hmm. I'd say if the resort is windy or anything like that, you need to work out a way for your staff to be able to go and enjoy the conditions a little bit every day. Yeah. And the guests love it. They love seeing their instructor be good at it. And they're like, oh, look at them. Oh, look, here's, here's my instructor, Sandy. Cover. You know, they love it. <laughs> you know, it, it, it creates that um, it creates that vibe. They realize, oh, we're all here. for. We are literally all here because we love doing this. Anyway, enough about, enough about Nielsen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you're talking there a little bit about the guests. And I actually listened to your podcast with... Alex Bruce from the Global Season Air Network. My best pal. Yeah. 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 Is that who you were talking about at the beginning when you said Alex? No. So Bruce, mm -hmm. that was a different Alex. Okay. Well, Alex Bruce, but we, we know him as Bruce. Bruce was a fairly late addition to the party. I didn't really meet Bruce until 2016 when he did a season in Vass for Nielsen. Okay. And then we went to Cape Town together for three months. He came on the windsurf trip with us and I got to know him there. And then neither of us do seasons anymore, but he, he also comes and lives in Vass with me in the summer and we just hang out. And he, he's very much a snowboarder, not a windsurfer, but he's also a, ve he's also a very good windsurfer as well. I was listening to your podcast with him where you did it in person and you were yep. talking about being seasoners, of course. So that was very interesting to me. I wanted to hear what oh, cool. you guys had Thank to you. say about it. And yep. um, you were talking about customer interaction and... Mm -hmm. It was hilarious to hear you talk about that famous <laughs> line of when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> oh, here we go. You are, you are opening a can of worms asking me about that. <laughs> now, this is something that has been, I think it's all season airs, winter, summer, whatever, that famous question, when are you going to get a real job? Tell us a little bit about your feelings about that, Sandy. <laughs> Yeah, I can tell you, you definitely listened to the podcast because I, I definitely it. went. Yeah, thank you. I definitely went on a bit of a rant about this. I mean, that sentence, that question drives me fucking mad. <laughs> like it drives me absolutely mad because I'm going to I'm going to answer it fairly simply. 
without me out there doing that job that you don't deem as proper, you would not be able to spend your money to come out and do the thing that you love doing most. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. So how do you how can you define it as not a proper job when in order for you to come out and, and enjoy this and do it, you need me. <laughs> you need me. You want to learn to do a, a carve jibe windsurfing? Then you need me. That is literally what you need. You, that's what you need. You need to pay me. When, when you go and do your, you know, your tennis lesson at home or whatever, your personal training session, do you sit and say to the personal trainer teaching you to deadlift, oh, so when you get a real job then, mate, <laughs> when you're going to get a real job, he punch you in the fucking face. <laughs> but they, for some reason, they come out, and like you said, I'm sure they do it in the mountains as well. They come out to the mountains or, or to the beach or whatever. They're, they're one holiday a year that they get from their real job in parentheses, in, in commas there, real job. They come out, you know, they get 14 days or whatever it is, 28 days, and the two weeks they come out and they bring the family, and, right, we're all going here. And then they meet Sandy, who's going to, he's going to teach me to water start, and it's going to be brilliant. And then I teach him, and then at the end of the week, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks, I had a great week. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, what's your, what's your plans there? When are you going to get a real job? And I'm like, <laughs> I've just delivered my real job to you, mate. I've literally just done it. Yeah. Like, you're leaving this holiday a better windsurfer than you arrived at. And you, you've probably had a great time as well. How is that not deemed as a real job? And even the bar staff and the guys working in the kitchen and everything like that, you know, to sit there, you wouldn't say it to your waiter at a restaurant when you're back in the UK or <laughs> yeah, at home. That's true. You don't, you don't start chatting to them in your favorite restaurant and go, oh, when are you going to get a real job then? <laughs> it's so, it makes absolutely no sense. It's so true. I don't understand what goes through the mind of a guest when they ask this like how what are they expect are they like oh they'll find this funny they'll think i'm pretty cool <laughs> or or are they just doing it to be a dick yeah i don't get it it's jealousy <laughs> i think gen no genuinely like that is yeah gina that is it it is jealousy they're sat there going yeah cool i'm i've i've got this job and i'm on 55k a year and i've got my two kids and my wife and all i wish i could do is go and work on a beach in greece for six months but i've got my <laughs> i've got my million pound house in london and i've got two cars and and all and the dog and all this but actually i'd love to just disappear for three months and go windsurfing in cape town i'd love that or i'd love to go and spend the i'd love to go and spend a season in the mountains getting better at you know going back country snowboarding and stuff i'd love to do that yeah yeah you know and actually i think a lot of it is you know the the reality that we live as season airs is so far removed from so many of our guests' realities that they don't quite they don't quite comprehend that it's its own massive ecosystem and world and industry. It's a job. Yeah. Like these companies, you know, like you said, you know, Ingham's and Nielsen, whatever, make millions every year. It's not like we're doing it for free. Like it is a job. And once you I used to save money as a season air because they pay for my food and accommodation. I, when, I, when I took a job um, running a windsurfing center in the UK after I finished my seasons, after I'd paid for my flat and accommodation and, and my food in the UK and everything, I had just as much money as I had when I did my seasons in my pocket. I was like, uh, maybe I was saving, uh, you know, a couple hundred quid more a month in the UK. But I was like, I have just as much money to play with every month as I did in Greece. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah. I, I, and if I keep if I keep if I keep talking now, all, all I'll do is repeat repeat myself. But yeah, that's the basis. Is how how can you not call it a real job when without the job I'm fulfilling, your your holiday wouldn't exist. Exactly, exactly. The same yeah. here. Like I was a rep, a holiday rep for many many years. I had to have my phone on when I was a full time rep, twenty four hours a day, in case yeah. a guest rang me. 24 hours a day for anyone to phone up and just complain at me about something yeah. you know something's wrong with the hotel or something you know maybe yeah. they've had an accident on the mountain and they need some help and blah 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 like it is a job yeah <laughs> so yeah it is funny but I when I was listening to your podcast it did make me laugh thank you it was so funny that's a sad reflection of of where we're where we're at as a as a society of what is deemed as valuable is right yeah cool you need to have a house a house that you've paid for with your job that you never get to spend any time in because you're always at your job that you've used to buy the house with mm -hmm. and it's just this circle of just like nonsense and just acquiring things that you just don't need to the point where men especially have a mental breakdown when they're 45 years old and leave their wives and then you've just got problems and actually if they were just a bit more true to themselves when they were a bit younger and went yeah i'm gonna go and spend my years you know windsurfing and, and or, or whatever you know i i just um yeah it is it is a sad reflection of where we are that that's what we value more than actually 
enjoying ourselves and doing the things we love doing and doing seasons is such an amazing way of getting of doing that and having the time to do it you know so it's yeah did the societal pressure side of things ever get to you when you were doing your seasons uh only my last couple because i realized uh my age and i was kind of it's one of those ones where you you kind of start looking around and realizing that everyone else is younger than you and i think i i just started questioning what i was doing and i think at the time, maybe I wasn't, but I, I suppose I've always been a little bit ambitious. And I was, I kind of got to the point where I was like, right, I've, I've hit the roof here. Yeah. You know, I was, um, I was the highest level windsurfing instructor qualification you can achieve. I was, you know, helping manage the beach in Bass at Club Bass. You know, so I was helping run all the operations and the safety system and, you know, all, all that stuff. And I was like, right, I've hit this. And then I, I'd hit the roof because I was like, the management above me aren't going anywhere. So I was like, I'm, there's nowhere for me to go. And and that whole season, I, I'd realized that. So I was like, right, where, you know. What's next? Yeah, and, and that was where I had that, you know. I think one too many people asked me when I was going to get a real job, when I was already worrying. And I had, it had got into my own skin of worrying, fuck, is this not a real job? And only mm-hmm. now, you know, a few years later, do I look back and go, oh, mate, now that I've got a real job, I suppose, I was like, shut up. You're an idiot. You know, (laughs) why why was I worried about it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that was the only time really where I was questioning it and going, well, you know, prior to that, I was just too busy having a good time and, you know, trying to build what I was doing out there. I think that's something that's come through about, you said there that you weren't, you didn't see yourself as very ambitious until the end there, into the end of your seasons. But actually, when you listen to your story, it sounds like you were always kind of, thinking of the next step ahead you were always kind of trying to progress you were always trying to get to the next level so no yeah literally as that as i as i said that sentence just now i was like actually that's absolute shit (laughs) yeah i i i worked you know pretty hard with the the windsurfing and you know training i hate the word training because it's not it's not like i was an athlete but like you know I, i worked really hard to like get better at windsurfing and i was kind of sponsored and supported by quite a few brands in the industry and oh cool um, and that, that's what actually led to what I do now. You know, I was like, right, well, I'll, I'll try and grow my own Instagram and stuff and my own following for these sponsors and stuff. And then that was the kind of realization after my traumatic time working in the UK in the industry that I was like, right, well, I'm going to leave this. And what, what can I do? And I was like, well, pretty good at social media stuff. So I was like, why don't I take all this stuff of growing my own Instagram and all this stuff, you know, with these brands? Mm-hmm. And why don't I try and help other businesses do it? And and that's what I can do as a living. And I can do that from wherever and still live this amazing season lifestyle and live in Greece all summer and, and, and things like that. Is that what happened next then? You kind of went back to the UK and started doing the social media stuff? I finished my last season in 2017. Okay. So that, yeah, five years ago this year. So I, I finished that season. After that, I was kind of umming and ahhing what to do about whether to go back to VAS or this and then something a job at a, a very good center in the UK came up as their assistant manager and it was just at the time I was like this is the perfect next step for me it's on an amazing an amazing place in the UK for windsurfing called the Witterings on the south coast and um one of my best mates Ed was was moving down there incidentally to do an internship with another business not in windsurfing so I was like oh cool perfect we can live together and all this so I went down and did that and I did that uh, I left there in September 2019, and then that that was when I started setting up my own kind of social media thing. So um, I started my own business like four or five months before a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, which was interesting to say the least. So yeah, I I worked there from start of you know February 2018 till September 2019, and then since then I've been doing the the kind of social media thing that I do now. Awesome, and you said at the beginning that you didn't go to uni how did you kind of navigate setting up a social media business did you have much experience in that or do you know what i just learned a lot of it from literally just doing my own instagram okay. like my own my own sandy Clunas as a as a windsurfer I, I kind of taught myself and i i read a few things and and then the business i was working for in the uk alongside me being the assistant manager i kind of gave myself the title of social media manager and I was, you know, going out and I take pictures of people when they come in from a session. And I kind of taught myself how to do all the Facebook like catalog stuff, you know, like uh, people can sell stuff on Instagram and things like that. You know, like you go and say you go on like 
I don't know, Quicksilver, whatever, and they've got a new ski jacket and you tap the picture and it comes up and you can buy it straight there. Yeah. I taught myself how to do all that because we were an online store. So I did, all, I did all that stuff and taught myself how to do it. And I, I taught myself how to run some like paid ads for, for them on, on Instagram and, and all this stuff. And then I think I got to the point where I was like, I enjoy that way more than the managing a, wind, a water sports center. I love like taking the pictures and posting about it and write, doing all the writing and stuff like that. And I, you know, I wrote a couple of articles about the spot for a, a windsurf magazine in the UK. And I was like, well, oh, I love all this stuff. And then that kind of led me to go, right, well, actually I can, I can probably like try and turn this into something. Um, and I, I spent the day with a couple of friends. At the time, my best mate, Ed, was working for a company called Stance that makes socks. I know Stance, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was working for Stance. So I went and spent the day uh, in the office with their social media manager. Cool. And they had another freelancer who worked for them, a guy called Sam, who I still work with today. He's an absolute hero. And I still put all of this down to to him. And I went and met him for the day and, I just wanted to confirm like this is something that people do. And he was like, he was like, it's very much something people do. And it's very much something, you know, businesses need help with. And it's a thing. So I was like, cool. So, and I thought I'll just do it for a year. And if it doesn't work, I'll have a year of experience and I'll get a, I'll get a job with a company doing it. And luckily enough, even through a pandemic, it seemed, seemed to have worked. And and now I, now I very much work on my own time. And I think that was the most important thing for me. Again, something you may have gathered from me is, it's going windsurfing is very, very important to me, mm-hmm. you know, going out on the water myself. And I realized that I, I needed to do a job which would allow me to be able to go, right, everything's, you know, it's windy today. It's a bit like when you guys get fresh powder on the mountain, every, the, everything downs tools and right, we're going, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's the same thing. I'm like, right, cool. The, the forecast looks good. I am not working tomorrow. I'm going to drive an hour and a half down the road and I'm going to go windsurfing or I'm going to go and live in Greece all summer and I'm going to work all morning on my laptop and then I'm going to windsurf all afternoon because I can. Yeah. You know, and I realized that was the life balance that I needed. And it, yeah, I don't know. I sometimes worry that it sounds a bit privileged and things like that, but I mean, it's all relative. But yeah, that 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 was what I needed. I, I you know, both mentally and that's what I wanted to do in my life. I want, you know, I want to keep windsurfing. I want to still be windsurfing to the level I'm at when I'm 50. Yeah, so that 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 was that was kind of how it um how it came about. Very long story, sorry. No, it's a great story. It's good to hear. Like other people might be inspired to do the same thing, you know. So Yeah, for sure. Whatever we can whatever information we can share is always good. So thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. Um so you also have a podcast. I so do. You mentioned that at the beginning of the show. Tell us about your podcast. When did that start and what is the idea behind it? So coinciding with me finishing working at the center I worked at in the UK. Again, very aware not to badmouth anyone or anything like that, but um, I didn't have the best experience working there. It was also coinciding with me having a pretty bad time with my own mental health. At the end of 2018, I had a very, very bad time. And, oh, do you know, fuck it. The whole whole podcast is about talking about it. Yeah. I I almost took my own life and it was really bad and I didn't have a good time and my mum... I have very, very good support network in my girlfriend and my mum. Mm-hmm. My mum flew me back to Scotland and I had a couple of weeks up there reset. It was the year of the Gatwick drone. Do you remember the drone flying around Gatwick yeah. Airport? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I got, I got stuck in Scotland and I almost couldn't get back down south for Christmas. I had a really bad time and then I went back. 2019, I think, was, um, yeah, it was probably the most difficult year of my life. So 2019, I went back to do another season I suppose it was kind of seasonal. I'd have like six to eight weeks off over the winter Mm -hmm. where, you know, December, January, basically we'd shut and then we'd start getting everything ready in February and we'd open on the 1st of March. So I I was going to do something that winter and my mum was like, just, just chill. So I just like played video games and sat and I, and I was thinking like, I want to do something with mental health. I want to do something. So I'm having a bad time and I'd like to help other people and blah, blah, blah. And then I ended up having a real bad year that year. And it, it all came to a head in me and my girlfriend went to Fuerteventura in July. Anyone who doesn't, doesn't know, I I imagine a lot of your uh, listeners are are primarily winter season people, so they maybe don't know, but Fuerteventura is is a a very big windsurfing destination. Mm -hmm. It's one of the windiest, windiest places in the world. And and every year there, they do the the world cup. So they do the, the professional windsurfing association, do a, the world tour event there. So they do a freestyle and a slalom event there. So I do, I do freestyle windsurfing and, I was invited to compete while we were there. They were like, "Do you wow. want a, a what? Do you want a wild card for the event?" 
and I couldn't take the wild card because I had to fly home and go back to my job. And that was a real catalyst for, right, something needs to change here. Because I was like, whilst like I'll hold my hands up, I'm I'm not good enough to compete on the world tour. I might I'd have been able to do a few moves, but I highly doubt I would have got through a heat. But just to be able to say I'd done that and have the have the competition vest and put it on the wall when I'm older and things like that, you know. And 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 a lot of my friends have gone and competed. My very you know best friends who I learned you know we, we all learned our freestyle together. They competed and stuff. So there is part of me that you know I'm I'm sad that I'm the only one that doesn't have a won't have a vest on the wall when we're older. And that that was a real catalyst, and and that just I was already wanting to leave, and I needed something to change, and I was just so depressed and down and anxious, and you know, I, like we said, it's the societal pressures of like, why don't I have a house yet, and all this, and you don't have that when you're on seasons because everyone thinks the same as you. But when you come back to the UK after seasons, and you're like, I feel like I'm still in season brain a bit, and I don't really know if I want to buy a house and stuff, but. Everyone else is like, oh, I've got all this money and we're buying a house and we're doing this and that. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, I really, really struggled with it. And then, yeah, after Fuerteventura, literally the, the day after I got home, I went into work and I handed my notice in. And I said, I'm, I'm quitting. Mm-hmm. So so that, yeah, combined with my own mental health, everything, I was like, things, things have got to change. And then the social media, everything started. And at the end of 2018, I'd started listening to podcasts mainly about films. I'm hugely passionate about, about movies, film and TV and things like that. So I was listening to these, these podcasts about films and stuff and I, I was loving it. I was absolutely loving it. And then I think once I'd quit my job and I had my first couple of months as a social media manager and straight away I got a couple of clients and I was working and I was like, cool, this is, you know, I mean, I wasn't earning loads of money, but like I could pay my rent mm-hmm. and I, I had a bit of money in my pocket and I was like, okay, sweet. I think that just gave me a bit of confidence. And I was like, do you know what? I'm quite good at talking. I've been an instructor for almost the last 10 years. I'm quite good at chatting. I love listening to podcasts. I want to do something about mental health. And it all just kind of came together. And I was like, cool, well, I'm going to start a podcast about men's mental health and try and just encourage more men to to talk and stuff like that. So um, my friend Alex Bruce, who you said you listened to mm-hmm. on the a podcast, he's one of my best friends and he, he's a regular contributor to the podcast. He comes, He's been on four or five times. The first ever episode, I went to his house and I was told to told him about it. And he was like, sick idea, sick idea. And I was like, would you be up for doing the first episode? And we went and, and we just sat down and I just put Garage Band on and we turned it on and we just talked. And um, I something happened, but I, I think I didn't save it right or something, but I lost the whole episode. Oh, no. And it was two hours. You know, it was one of those ones where like, I still say it's the best episode I ever recorded. But, um, <laughs> you know, it was one of those ones where we, we kind of stood up at the end of it and like, we were like a bit, you know, a bit emotional. We like hugged each other. We were like, that was so good. Wow. But yeah, uh, we, we lost it. So it, it took me a couple of weeks to bounce back from that. And then a couple of weeks later, I was like, right, I'm going to just sit down by myself in front of it and just record a kind of 20 minute intro. And I did that. And it's still my most listened to episode today, that intro. Oh, wow. So it was like, it was like a blessing in disguise, I suppose. Actually, I feel like doing an intro was probably a good idea. So yeah, I, I did that and it, it went really, really well. And that, that's that's been it since then. I I just I started trying to do an episode every week. When COVID started, I lost pretty much all of my clients, so I had loads of time. So I started putting out two episodes a week. Oh wow! I started doing like I I did a lot of like solo episodes, and I've recently started doing that again of just like fifteen twenty minutes of me talking about a certain subject, and then I just have guests on. There's no there's no real rhyme or reason to the guests I have on. You know, some some guests there's a huge conversation about mental health, and it gets a little bit heavy. Other conversations are, are a bit like this one, you know, just kind of chatting shit about. I, I obviously have a lot of season air uh, people on, and you know, windsurfers and people in extreme sports. Obviously, that's kind of my backyard. So they're the kind of people I've had on. And it's it's kind of I, I call it the the hobby that got out of hand. You know, I'm close, <laughs> closing in on closing in on 100, 100 episodes and it came in the top 100 podcasts in the UK on Spotify. Oh, wow. The last couple of years. And it, yeah, it's just it just kind of went a bit mental. I've, I've kind of taken my eye off the ball a bit this year, to be honest, because it can be quite exhausting to talk about mental health all the time. You know, yeah, it's yeah. difficult. So there's that. And then, you know, I've had other things on my my I'm fortunate enough that my business, my work has got a bit busier and. And I work for one of the windsurfing tours as well and, and all this stuff. So, yeah, so I, I've taken my eye off the ball a little bit. So I'm, that's why I'm very much appreciative of doing this podcast with you. Because I've not done one for a couple of weeks. So I'm like, oh, cool. It's, yeah, yeah. Something a little bit different. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I get to be on the other side. For yeah. Once, which is awesome. So, yeah, no, that, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of how it all started, really. Yeah. And it's called the After Hours Lounge. 
It is called the After Hours Lounge. As soon as I named it and put it out there, I was like, "Fuck, I hate this name. I need to change it." Um, <laughs> but then I've kind of, I've kind of just sat there. I, do you know one thing? I hate like your podcast is so good because you've got such a great name and it's so obvious what it's about. My one's so vague. But I, I, what I don't like is, or what I think you can't do is, if you're not famous, you can't call your podcast your own name. I can't call it the Sandy Clunas podcast. You can. No, mate, because people are like, people are like, who the fuck is this guy with a weird name that sounds like Santa Claus? <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I can't do that. So, um, so I didn't. But the, the idea behind it, and the, the the dream, the dream that I'd love to do, mm-hmm. I want the After Hours Lounge to become a physical place. Oh yeah, it, it's a place. It's a hub. It's somewhere that you know. When I remember when I was growing up and uh, you know a kid and even things like that, you know, like men especially would finish work every day. And they'd all go to the pub together and they'd sit and talk. They'd sit and talk to each other and just chat shit. And then they'd have a few pints and then they'd probably end up talking about what's going on in their heads and things like that. But now, because the world is so expensive or we've got no time or whatever, I don't think men do that anymore. They don't go and sit and talk to each other in the pub as much because they've got things to do or they're busy or, you know, they simply can't afford it because the world's so fucked at the moment. Yeah. But that's so important. So I was like, the After Hours Lounge is a place for people to come together and chat and have a beer and you know just chat some shit so i i envision it as a as a physical location and people come in and we have a chat and then and they leave and originally the podcast people would always bring a beer we talk about the different beers we were drinking while we did it oh cool but then i kind of stopped drinking so i don't really drink much anymore so i was like oh that's kind of weird but actually there's a non-alcoholic beer brand called days days brewing that uh made in scotland but they're based in london and they do a lot of stuff with mental health things and, and things like that. So shout out to Days Brewing for um, keeping me uh, not getting thirsty. I can't think of the word. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> they send over some uh, some beers now and then. So yeah, That's I, ha- so cool. I have them. But um, but yeah, my, because my relationship with drinking kind of changed a little bit over the last year or two. So Same. I, um... Oh, really? Yeah, I gave up drinking six months ago. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah, November the 3rd, nearly six months ago. Oh, wow. See, I, I've been really worried about putting like an absolute on it. Like saying like, right, no more drinking now. <laughs> Because you know, like, I, yeah. it's, it's it's. But I think it's it's each to their own, isn't it? I but I didn't. I'm very aware that I haven't stopped because I had a problem with it. I didn't have yeah. a problem. Yeah, same. I didn't. I, I anything like that. I just went. I'm fed up of feeling like shit and having an <laughs> exactly. upset stomach every day. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I do know what you mean. Yeah, it's the same for me. I just decided that. Uh, yeah, I don't feel like I've got a problem with it or anything. But yeah, mm. just decided that the few hours of fun wasn't really worth the two day hangover, <laughs> especially it. when you're trying to get shit done. So yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, I'm not saying I'll never have a drink again. But yeah, well, that's it. I think I think you can so easily pick and choose. And, and I think uh, culture is definitely changing. You know, when I was in Greece this summer, there were a lot of people around the beach bar every evening that wouldn't be drinking. Mm-hmm. I realized I wasn't the only one drinking cans of Fanta and sparkling water. You know, there were people doing it. And especially like younger people don't seem to be drinking as much as when I was 17, 18. You know, when I was that age, I was on a mission to get as drunk as I could every single night. And the younger guys who who I saw working in Greece, like they definitely didn't do that. It was a, it's a lot more about you know wholesome and let's get up early and go paddleboarding and all this stuff. And I think it, it's cool, but I, there's definitely a balance to be had. You know, I'm I'm flying up to Scotland tomorrow for my best mate's wedding on Saturday, mm-hmm. and I know I'm going to get absolutely <laughs> plastered there. <laughs> you know, I know I know that that's going to be amazing and it's going to be so much fun. And but then you know e- equally. I haven't really had a drink for ages. And then after that, I fly straight to Austria for a, a windsurfing event. Austria? Yeah, yeah I'm going to uh, Lake, Neus- Lake Neusiedl, it's called. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. So I, I fly there and that's a huge like festival party and everything. And I, I know I, I'm not drinking. I, I'm not, I'm not going to drink mm-hmm. while I'm there. I've got a job to do. So I'm like, no. I'm... So I think it's if you can find that happy medium, I think it's so good. Last summer, I felt so great just not drinking like the thing that annoyed me was the three or four beers every night you just don't need it if you're going to go out with your mates do it just go out go all out yeah but you don't need to have three or four beers with every meal what is the point you're just spending money and you're just getting (laughs) getting fat you know like (laughs) it's very (laughs) that's really interesting that you you kind of feel the same way Gina. that's really interesting Mm. but yeah that's that's why um i've taken the beer element of the podcast as has slightly um you know disappeared as well and also i realized perhaps if i'm talking really deeply about mental health and things like that 
probably drinking alcohol while I do it is maybe not the best idea. Do we drink anymore? So that side of it changed a bit. But the after hours lounge still exists. You can still come in and have a can of Fanta or whatever you like. You know, that's the idea of it. It's an awesome idea. Very, very honourable podcast that you Thank have. you very so much. Well done. Well, thank you. And I'm sure it's helping a lot of people, actually. You know, it's been a tough time over the pandemic, especially. But Yeah, absolutely. The world the way it is these days, it's uh, not an easy place. No, it's, so, it's yeah. not. Yeah, it's not easy being a human right now. No. And yeah, it's wonderful. All the messages I get and everything like that. Like, I'll hold my hands up. Like, even now, I, like, I find myself like welling up a bit thinking about it. Like, every time I get a message and, you know, I've been... I hate, I hate bigging myself up a bit, but it's a podcast, so it's funny to talk about. But like, you know, I was down in Cornwall a few weeks ago and we were in a bar and a guy came up to me and just said, oh, I listen to your podcast and all this. And I'm like, there's no reason why he should know me. I've got no affiliation to Cornwall, anything like that. Yeah. You know, and he just came up to me and said it and all this. And I was like, I, I kind of had to go outside and have a bit of a cry for a couple of minutes. Oh, you know, I was like, that's so I awesome. Couldn't, you know, I, couldn't, I literally couldn't believe it. So it, yeah, I think looking back on it i think it is the most fulfilling thing i've ever done and i i'm sure i can tell when you talk about yeah. it that it yeah i think it is I, I think i think it is there's you know there's a few things i would say but yeah that that is with all the amazing season things and everything like that but there are a few things better than feeling like you're helping other people and that sounds corny mm. as fuck but it's so true <laughs> it's so true it is true yeah 100 yeah, percent. no it's yeah and it's amazing it's amazing what you're doing as well i, I think it's a huge part of it. And I talk about it so much on my own podcast of like, I wish more people would go and do a season. I think it should be national service in the UK. Everyone should <laughs> write. You're going, you're going out to the Alps for the winter. You're going to Greece for the summer. You're going to do this. The skills that you learn and you l- you just learn how to talk to people and be a human being, but you don't even realize you're doing it. And that's the best bit. You don't realize what you're learning. You just wake up in six months time and you're like, I am a completely different human to who I was, at, yeah. you know, it's yeah yeah it's amazing yeah, another thing actually that came up on your podcast was there was a question from someone i don't know who it was who said is 29 too old to go and do your first season i did my first season at, i think it was 29 so it's definitely not too late i don't think you can put an age on it i think you've got to realize that there are certain realities that you're going to have to live with as a season now you're probably going to have to share a room you're probably you know there's going to be x amount of things but i've done seasons before with guys who are in their 40s who have decided to sack off working in the city and come and do it and have absolutely thrived and killed it you know like we had a couple of bike guides that are just we're in their 40s they've got a you know a house or whatever in the uk and they just rent that out for the summer and they come out and live and they have the best time and even for two two or three years the the bike guide at club vass a guy called steve shout out steve you're a legend steve was in his 60s and he's retired. He he worked up um he worked up electric pylons, you know, hugely dangerous job, but I think they pay you very well and you retire very early. Mm-hmm. And he retired when he was late fifties, something like that. And he was like, Well, I used to go out there on holiday. So he was like, Cool. So he he came out and did the season. And his wife his wife Margaret, shout out Margaret, still brought me she brought me out a four litre tub of Heinz ketchup one year. Amazing. <laughs> That's a, that's a season essential. You Go don't on, want Margaret. To, you legend. Yeah, mate, the, the local the local ketchup is not something you want to mess around with. You need Heinz. <laughs> it's a game changer. So yeah, no. Um, and Steve did it, and and obviously he did. You know, did things differently. You know, you don't see him much in the evening, but he's around all day, and he's up early every morning doing the rides with all the and the guests loved him. Honestly, <laughs> they fucking loved him. They couldn't get enough of him. You know, he, all the. CSQs, you know, the customer service questionnaires at the end, every single one of them was just, who's your favorite? Steve, 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 Steve. <laughs> you know, they all, and he'd, you know, he'd spend, he, he just, he just did his own thing. And, and I think what, when, I think when you get a bit older, you are, you do kind of figure out who you are a bit more and you become a bit more sure of yourself. And I think that really shines in a season air environment if you're willing to lean into it. Yeah. If you go in thinking, oh, this is going to be a bit like when I was on holiday, then yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, no, that's interesting what you say. You do have to be prepared to like share a room or live in a friggin' crack den or whatever. Yes. You know? Yeah, so yeah, literally. It is those things that once you've had your own house or whatever, you know, you've had your own space, you do kind of have to go back to, I guess, what it's like in uni. I don't know. I never went to uni. But No, me neither. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you're, yeah, if you're willing to throw yourself into, um, you know, in, into the whole vibe and everything like that, it's going to be the best thing ever. But if you're going to resist a few things, the only problems I ever saw was older people that have come out on holidays there and then decided to do a season. And I feel like they almost assumed that it was going to be a bit like when they were out on holiday. 
and they very swiftly realize it's not like when they're out on holiday no. it's very very different actually working there and that was it but if you if you know you're going in to do a job like i said at the beginning if you know that it's a, it's a job you're going in there to work if you know you're going in to do that it's going to be amazing it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how old you are yeah, yeah yeah like yeah. the hours can be long the pay can be low the accommodation can be shit but you can have a great time so. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> And we hear more from Sandy after this very quick ad break. Fancy taking the leap and working abroad? Right now, Gap360 are giving away 150 free working holiday visas worth £369 on a first-come, first-served basis when you book a working holiday in Australia. With a range of diverse jobs available in hospitality, office, retail, farm work, childcare, construction and more, Gap360 can help you work and play the Aussie way in 2022. Start your working holiday with a fun, life-changing week in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane with a group of like-minded travellers before 12 months of job support from Gap360's local dedicated teams to find your perfect job down under. Terms and conditions apply. Visit the Gap360 website for details or click the link in the show notes. So I guess we should just get on to my questions now we haven't even hit them yet shoot obviously you said that you did some work away in australia do you have any advice you can share for our listeners about the visa application process for that yeah i mean like i said that that's the only place i've ever needed to sort a visa for um the first time i went i remember it was just like a tourist visa because i was just doing a course Mm -hmm. um and it was all very relaxed everything like that the second time i went i did it's called a working holiday visa and the important thing to bear in mind is I think, I don't know if it's changed now, but at the time, you can only have one of these in your life. You can only get one once. And I think you can only get them if you're under 30. Again, I think this might have changed because of COVID as well. I think they loosened the age thing. because obviously a lot of people wanting to go when they're 29 and obviously now they're 32 because of COVID. Oh uh, yeah, of course. One of my friends was was looking to go, who's, a, who's actually a nurse and he was looking to go. And I know he said they'd relax the age thing, but I think he was going in a different visa. But as far as I know, the working holiday visa, which is the one you want if you wanted to go and do a season out there, just bear in mind, you can only ever have one. I've used mine now. I can't ever use that visa again. Mm -hmm. I think it's valid for a year. I only use mine for six months. But I think that's why you see a lot of Australian, or a lot of people in Australia going and doing like the farm work and things like that. Basically, in order to get a second year on it and things, you need to contribute to the economy of Australia. So you go out and you work on these huge... Uh, farms out in the outback for a few months kind of do you do your time I suppose and then you get given your granted your your visa for a second year kind of thing Mm -hmm. I will say do it plenty of time in advance because I remember I reckon it can take a little while you don't want to do it a week before you go away but yeah yeah I'm just very aware that I'll never get that visa again so obviously if I did want to go back to Australia things like that it, it would be difficult that's when you you need to start looking for a business to sponsor you or you can there's all sorts of different ones and there's loads of loopholes not loopholes that makes it sound like it's illegal or something like that but there's loads of like ways that you can get in on different visas and, yeah. and things like that but the best thing to do is get in touch with whatever business you want to go out and work for you know whether it's going and working in Threadbow in the mountains in Australia or if you're going to work at in on the beach in Sydney like what I did you 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 just get in contact and generally every business out there that wants overseas staff usually have a great process in place to help you. If someone was planning to only do one season, where would you recommend them to go and why? Obviously, like I feel pretty biased that I would say Vass. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I I don't know. But because I didn't do my first season there, I did my first season at a much more general resort place. Um, and I thought that was an amazing place to do a first season. So it's difficult because it's like, well, what does that person want to do? I would say, to be honest, go somewhere really big and general. You know, somewhere like, uh, you know, Nielsen have got a place called Lesvos, which offers everything. You know, they do mountain biking, tennis, yoga, spa, uh, windsurfing, sailing, foiling, wakeboarding. They've got every activity you can think of. They've got it. And I think going and doing a season there and figuring out how everything works and the ecosystem and learning what each person does and stuff gives you so much knowledge to go into any other resort and go, oh, I know what's going on here. Whereas going somewhere very specific and smaller, if you end up going to a, you know, another resort or anything, I guess it can get overwhelmed. But I mean, obviously you said only to do one season, so maybe I've answered it wrongly. But first season, go somewhere big and figure it all out, learn the ecosystem, work out how it all works. 
and get to know people, stuff like that. If you're only doing one season, I mean, for me, if you want to go somewhere in the sun and learn a sport, then yeah, go to Vass. Awesome. Go, go and go to Vass. If you want to have a good time, have some parties and get good at a sport that requires wind, then go to Vass, you know. What was your best job and what was your worst job and why? See, this is a difficult one because I only really had one job. Yeah, on I was going to say. <laughs> I, was only ever, I was only ever water sports instructor. So what I'll do, I'll talk about the stupidest tasks I was ever given. Okay, yeah, great. Love that. <laughs> yeah, mo- most of these windsurfing centres, they are set on decking over the, over the kind of grass and then, you know, paths leading down to the beach. So quite often in between this wooden decking, you would have grass growing. Uh, grass growing up through and one particularly pedantic Nielsen manager once gave me a pair of crisscross kids scissors from the creche oh god you know the ones that cut paper in a jaggedy way uh, I was given a pair of scissors like that and was told to go and cut the grass between the decking boards no so I went and lay down on the decking bear in mind the decking is in front of the restaurant in the hotel so all the guests are sat there going what the fuck is he doing <laughs> and I I went and sat there <laughs> And cut the grass as oh a twenty-one-year-old windsurfing instructor. I suppose that's that. That's the equivalent of the worst job. Stupidest. Uh, best job, just just teaching in general, especially as I kind of climbed the ranks and I started teaching the advanced advanced windsurfers, things like that. Generally, the advanced guys, a lot of the windsurfers in the advanced groups would generally be men, probably about twice my age mm-hmm. at the time, and they've been learning this same move that they're trying to learn you know, the same turn or whatever it is, they've been learning it for the last kind of five or 10 years and they just haven't managed to crack it. And and each time one of them managed to crack something like that was remarkable. You know, like sitting in the power boat with the video camera, filming them all coming round and they'd get it. And uh, yeah, just teaching and seeing people just be so stoked when they learn something new and and you know that you know that they've done it because of you. You know, that's that's an amazing feeling. So yeah, I'll just say that as corny as that sounds. That's the best bit about the job for me. When you watch people achieve, it is. It just gives you such a buzz. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah shocking that they'd make you cut that grass. That's... Yeah, that's... Um... What Like, what do you think they were thinking at that point in time? I think they were thinking, Sandy's pissed me off and I'm going to humiliate him. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a punishment that... job then. <laughs> it was ab- absolutely a punishment job, yes. <laughs> do you know what you did to piss them off? I was probably just hung over and being a cheeky little shit. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, fair play. <laughs> I've never dealt very well with authority, so I think it was just that. I think and he was like, Right, well if you're gonna be a little shit, I'm gonna give you a stupid job and he gave me a stupid job. <laughs> you know. Awesome. So what is the best place you've ever visited and why? I don't know. That it's such a difficult one because there's so many amazing places, you know. Some sometimes I sit there and I go, I just wish I was back in Scotland at home with my family you know, with my mum and on yeah. the beach in Scotland. I feel like I'm being such a one trick pony here, but I probably just say like Vass, like it's, it's home for me. It's, I worked out recently. That's over the last 10, 12 years or whatever. I've spent more time there than anywhere else. I'm like, that's, it's the best place because I know every time I'm there, like I said, I'm, I'm the best version of Sandy and all my friends are, when I'm out there, all my friends are there as well. And yeah, there, um, also Cape Town holds a particular special place in my heart. That city. I'm not, I'm not a city person at all, but, I lived in Cape Town for two winters and it's the coolest place in the world. It's awesome. Where and when, I was just going to ask, when was your favourite season and why? My favourite season was 2016 in Vass. We've all kind of said it. All of us that worked there over the years have all said, you know, there was something about 2016. I think all of us that had been working there for a few years, that was quite a few people's last seasons because we'd all been there for quite a while there was no struggles with anything. We were all, it was a very well-oiled machine by that point. It was also a very, very windy season, which is always amazing. It's always better when it's, when it's windy. For me, I, I was coming off the back of being in Cape Town and I'd had an amazing trip to Cape Town and I'd kind of got more sponsors and things like that. And I, I was just in a very good place. I met the girl that season that I'm still with now. Yeah, Heidi, who's a, another uh, windsurfing instructor. So, you oh, know, I, awesome. I met her and that was six years ago and we're still together. So that was, that's nice. pretty cool. It was just like the best year. So yeah, yeah, summer 2016 was the best season. Awesome. And who were you sponsored by? Are you allowed to say their names? Yeah, yeah. I was sponsored by uh, a brand called Mystic. They make wetsuits, harnesses, clothing, all that kind of stuff. So I was sponsored by them uh, at the time. And then I was sponsored by a windsurfing brand called RRD. 
I was sponsored by a shop in the UK called Boardwise. They sort out a lot of the gear for everyone. Shout out to Boardwise. They just sorted me out with my new gear as well. And then I was sponsored by a watch brand called Black Church for a while. But then they kind of just disappeared. I don't know. I don't think they're a business anymore or anything. But oh, okay. that was pretty cool. They sent me like 15 watches and all this, all this stuff. So <laughs> I was pretty happy with it. Like I've said throughout the whole thing, I was just, I was very much like, I'll just always put myself out there and just ask people. So I just, I just did that and it worked quite well for a few years. I just got loads of free shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that, that all kind of peaked in 2016. You know, everything was all, everything was all going very, very well. So yeah, that, that was the best season. Yeah. And where is your favorite place to windsurf? See, this is a difficult one because for the vibes, Vass, for the conditions, Cape Town. Okay. Yeah. The wind in Vass is great, but it's quite gusty. It doesn't kick in till the late afternoon. It can be a bit of a faff, but just the vibe of sailing with everyone and all your friends and everything like that and the, the scenery and everything is amazing. But for conditions, Cape Town, or more recently, I got back, literally last week, I got back from a place called Dakla in uh in the western sahara and that as well oh, oh for, uh can i change my answer yeah. um i'm changing my answer uh <laughs> so vast for the vibes uh for aventura for the conditions in your opinion what is the best thing about season life or being a seasoner in general it's really fucking fun <laughs> <laughs> that's a good answer so that's one thing yeah, yeah yeah it's it's really really fun and it sets you up for the rest of your life in so many ways that you don't realize at the time. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Can you tell us about a challenge or difficulty you faced during your season air journey and what did you learn from it? 2015 was a difficult year for me. I, I had a, it wasn't even a difficult breakup, but basically my, my first like proper girlfriend who I was with for a couple of years, we split up just before that season, 2015. I went out to Greece that year met a girl who I just should probably shouldn't have been with. I was drinking far too much. To be honest, after what we talked about alcohol earlier, that's the only year where I was like, oh yeah, I had a bit of a problem with booze. Right. I was just drinking a lot of spirits and every time I got drunk, I was getting very, very angry. And quite regularly, I just throw a load of glasses all over the terrace and I'd smash up the furniture and all this. And it got to the point where my, my manager, Ollie, kind of took me to the side and was like, you know, and I kind of just broke down in front of him and it was, you know, I was like, I don't know what to do and all this. And he, I wasn't allowed, to, he, he banned me from drinking anything other than bottles of Heineken. I, the bar staff wouldn't serve me anything except bottles of Heineken. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was to kind of, and it, but it really sorted me out and it just it leveled my head out a little bit. And I think everyone has that season where I don't even know if it stemmed from the breakup that I had or anything like that. But I think it was a little bit. And I was like, I'm just going to go wild. And I think I did. I just went a bit, I went a bit berserker and it just didn't work. And it, it brought out the worst in me. And I was just drinking way too much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the biggest difficulty I had during my season air career, I suppose, was, yeah, just that realization that year of like, oh, you, can re you can be such a dick so easily. <laughs> you know, you really need to keep a lid on it, keep the ego in check and not drink so much. And yeah, that was the biggest lesson I learned. Thanks for sharing. No problem. Yeah, yeah. What's one thing you wish you had known before going on your first season? That the ketchup in Greece is shit. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I don't. I don't wish I'd known anything because I think it's so important to go in and have a new experience. I don't think I needed to know anything. I think part of the excitement of living this lifestyle is going into the unknown. I literally went somewhere completely new a couple of weeks ago at 30 years old and I don't I don't sit there and wish, oh, I wish I knew what the journey was like and all that yeah. stuff. You know, what I, I don't want to know what it was like when I arrive. I want it to be a surprise. You know, at 18 years old, traveling to Athens and stuff, I was so excited. I was like, this whole new world in front of me. I, I'm glad I didn't know anything, you know. Apart from the ketchup situation, but. Apart from that, yeah, that ketchup. Let me tell you. <laughs> Are there any opportunities or unlikely stories that stand out to you that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't left? scotland to go and work your first season just like my i don't know just my entire life to be honest my whole life has since i since i became an adult uh, at 18 or you know since i left school my whole life has been shaped by doing my seasons there's no specific opportunity or, or anything like that as we've said and i've spoken about it a bit through this and that's one remarkable thing about doing podcasts i always find there's like an accidental theme to every conversation I feel like the one, this one has just been me saying yes to loads of shit. So I felt like there's been a lot of opportunities that I took, but I think that just came from 
me just being like, well, yeah, let's just have an experience. And I'll just say yes. And I like people and things. One more thing I wanted to ask you, which I haven't asked you yet, actually, is I saw you'd done some commentating. How did that come about? Yeah, that came about around this time last year. I've done the podcast. Obviously, as I said, I've been fairly close proximity to professional windsurfing and things like that. And I, a lot of them are friends and, you know, lived with a few of them in Cape Town and worked with quite a few of the guys there and was halfway to being a pro myself and things like that. And then obviously doing the podcast, things like that. And then one of my friends, a guy called Adam Sims, who's an incredible windsurfer and has been a pro for many years from the UK. He has his own kind of production company doing a lot of videos in the industry. And, and he took over the Europe. Well, it's not the European tour now. It's just called the Freestyle Pro Tour. So the freestyle tour in windsurfing, basically. And last year, he basically literally sent me a message on Facebook being like, hey, mate, do you want to come to Austria in a couple of weeks and commentate the event for the live stream? And for me, that's like a dream role. Like Heidi, my girlfriend, remembers me when I was having a really bad time in 2019 and, you know, quitting my job and all this. She remembers me kind of sitting on my bed, being a bit upset and kind of saying, why can't I just go and commentate windsurf events? Why can't they just pay me to do it? So... I don't know. I feel like there's a certain amount of, I suppose, manifesting or something where I was like, that is what I'm going to do. And, and it, it came true last year. So obviously last year was a very difficult year still with events and COVID and stuff. So I went to Austria and that was very difficult. You know, I had men with guns questioning me at Heathrow Airport, asking me where I was going. And I was like, well, I had about 10 or 15 different bits of paper saying, look, this is legit and things. But then mm -hmm. so I did that. And then in September last year, I went to Rhodes to, to do that. We only actually ended up doing those two events last year because it's so difficult. Everything got cancelled. But yeah, th this year there's like eight or nine events. So I'm flying to, I'm literally flying to Austria uh, a week today. Amazing. To do that event again. It's the opening event of the season in Austria. And then... And then I'll be flying later on in the year. I'll be going to Turkey and Rhodes and all these other, yeah, a load of other places as well. That is so incredible. Yeah, it's like, it's real, like, it's dream job shit, you yeah. know? It's something that I've always, you know, loved doing the commentating and stuff like that. I, I mean, to be honest, I put it down to the podcast. You know, I think people always knew I was quite chatty and things like that. But I think just through the experience I've had with the podcast, I think that was what influenced the decision to invite me to do it. That is so cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll say that as well. If, if anyone's thinking of starting like a, a podcast or a, any, anything you're thinking of doing, like just do it. You have no idea where it might lead to. You literally have no idea. Absolutely. When you were away, what did you miss most about your home country? You're going to say ketchup, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Like, oh, sounds so lame, but just like my mates there, my mates mm -hmm. from home, I'm still, I'm still so close to three or four of them. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't hugely popular at school. <laughs> I had so, this real core group of friends. So I, I just kind of like miss them, you know, want to see them. And like I said, I'm literally going to one of their, one of their weddings on Saturday evening. I'm flying to Scotland tomorrow for that. And, you know, he's one of my best mates and I'd have loved to, but it's funny, you know, they, and this is something as well, I think a lot of season airs experiences when they leave home and do that and you come back and it's so easy to look at your hometown and go, God, it's such a shithole. It's such a shithole. I've been, I've been to all these places and this place is such a shithole. It's like, <laughs> no, it's not, mate. It's not. It's what you, it's what you make it. And, you know, I've had conversations with my friends and, you know, my friends have openly said, they're like, nah, I don't want to come and visit you. I don't need to. They're like, they're not into traveling. They don't want to travel. But just because they're doing this completely different thing in life to me and I'm traveling and living out of a bag and being a seasonaire and stuff and they're they're building careers and lives and buying houses and stuff. But I still come home and it's still like it's still just the same as when we were 17. So I'd say they, yeah, them and the ketchup are who I miss. And my, and my family, of course, I can't take them away from it. But my mum used to come out and visit all the time and everything like that. So whereas my mates have never really been out to visit other than one of them. So, yeah, my, my friends, friends and family, I suppose, and the ketchup. And the ketchup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you could go back and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? See, I actually did. This is this is funny. I went and looked at it earlier today. I did a when I turned thirty in August. I did an Instagram post on my podcast Instagram. I did an Instagram post of like messages to my twenty year old self. Oh, cool. It was seven or eight kind of things, and they were kind of funny, but also kind of true. I think. Well, there was like funny ones like drink bottles, pints will make you shit yourself. I mean, that's quite a funny one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, things like, I don't know, like one of the biggest ones I wrote, and, and it maybe sounds a bit silly, but I wrote, keep windsurfing. I know you're really frustrated with it right now and you feel like you're not, I feel, you feel like you're not getting anywhere, but you're actually going to get pretty good at it. Oh, yeah. That was something I wrote to myself. I remember at that time 
in my first season in VAS and I was frustrated with it and all my friends around me were doing tricks and I was very much still just learning the learning the fundamentals of being a of still being an advanced windsurfer but you know still the fundamentals I wasn't anywhere near doing tricks and things I think a lot of people sit there and I do it as well of you know life is short life is short life is short but like it's not short it's not that short you've got loads of time you don't need to do everything right now sometimes it's cool to just slow the fuck down and just enjoy what you're looking at right now yeah and i suppose that's what i do i'd be like mate you know just enjoy every season for what it is i'm not one of those people to to go back and say oh i wish i'd done this differently on each season because i feel like everything kind of worked out you know for a reason and again it goes back to what i said earlier of I wouldn't want to give myself advice or things like that. You know, I, I'd want to just let myself being that age experience it. But one thing I would say is, yeah, just stop being so frustrated about certain little things, like like my windsurf level and thinking that people think less of me because I'm not as good at windsurfing as my mates. Thinking like that, like, mate, just, just uh, people don't care. If you just focus on being a being good person and, and maybe if you could just save an extra like 100 quid, you know, <laughs> a month. Put it in Bitcoin. This is 2011. Put it in Bitcoin, mate, and you'll be retired when you're 30. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> On the topic of advice, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? And what is the worst piece of advice you've ever received? This is an interesting one. I can't tell you what the worst piece of advice I've ever received is because I've never taken it in. I've never, I've never let it sit there. Mm -hmm. The best piece of advice I've ever received, and it's something that I live with to this day, and I've done a full podcast about just this sentence, is do it, then it's done. Ooh. Now, do it, then it's done, to me, is like a little creed. It's a little lifestyle of like realizing that you have certain things that you need to do. And actually, if you just do it, then it's done. You know, <laughs> like it's a bit like, you, you know, being anxious about something that you know you've got to go and do. And you can sit there all day going, oh, fuck, I've got to go, oh, I've got to go do this thing. You know, I'm sure you get it on like, you know, seasons. I've, right, I've got this private lesson. Oh, I've got to go and got to go talk to this guest and arrange this private lesson with them. Oh, fuck, so kind of, I'm so hungover. I can't be bothered. You know, just do it, mate. Just literally as soon and as soon as you're there, the anxiety and the frustration of having to go and do something is only there before you start doing it. Once you start doing it, you're in the process. It's happening. You know, I'm sitting there going, oh, I'm trying to put this lesson off as long as possible because I'm absolutely dying and I need to relax. But actually, as soon as I get out there and I'm teaching, you know, you, you go into autopilot and you're, blah, blah, blah. and I'm sure it's the same for you, you know, as a rep, you know, you've got, a, you're sat there on the bus at the front and everyone's there and you're dying and you're like, I've got to stand up and do this speech. I've got to stand up and say, <laughs> hi guys, hi guys, welcome to wherever, you know, but as soon as you do it, as soon as you do it and you're up there and then you finished and then you get to sit there and just wallow in your hangover or <laughs> whatever and that's that's something as well that i've taken into my my life outside of seasons now you know is because i'm uh work on my own time now i listen to that advice even more yeah of like if i get all this done then it's three o'clock or then it's two o'clock and i can i can sit for two hours and talk to gina on a podcast because i've done all my work i'm done for the day yeah, yeah. and then once i finish once i finish this i can go and do whatever i want and things you know it's it's so yeah do, and and that wasn't just me that was um that was a mindset that was instilled in at Club Vass. Every every single one of us had that mindset of like, do it, then it's done. That's so good. And we all used to sit, you know, everyone would be hung over and just it would take one or two people to say that and we'd all be like, right, come on then, let's go do it. You know, so there there was that real team thing of, yeah, do it, then it's done. We talk a lot about mentors on the show. Did you have any mentors who helped you along in your journey? Absolutely. The man who said, do it, then it's done to me. His name is Ollie Scott. He's been the Club Vass manager uh, I think his first year as manager was 2011, 2010. Before that, he, you know, he's the king of season airs. I know you'll you'll probably ask me later on, but you, if you want to talk more about summer seasons, you should definitely get Ollie on. Again, you know, very singular has only done the club bass and stuff, but he's just full of full of wisdom. Yeah, everyone's got their own, you know, their own demons and stuff. But I think that that's what makes Ollie even better is, you know, he's he has had his own issues, but every every story you can think of that you've had on a season, he's he's been through it as well, and he's still still out there and he you know running it. And it, Clavas is a huge operation; he's got such a massive job on his hands. Nobody ever asks him when he's going to get a proper job, you know. <laughs> and if they do, then they're if they do, then they're not far off getting knocked out. <laughs> but yeah, o Ollie Ollie's definitely been a real mentor to me, and you know, I still still chat to. Him. I was on the phone to him a couple of days ago. Like I'll never forget what he did that that year, 2015, when I was having a bad time, and he. 
he took me around the back of the sail rack so no one could see. And I think he was like, right, mate, break down now. No one else is going to see this. Yeah, he just kind of gave me a hug and was like, mate, Aww. I've been I've, I've been through it all, you know. I've had the you know relationship with a girl that I shouldn't be with and it's not working and you don't necessarily know what to do and you're drinking too much and all this. And he just really sorted me out. And then, you know, by stopping me drinking anything other than Heineken's, you know, it, it, like it sounds silly, but that was exactly what I needed. He needed to go, right, just don't fucking serve Sandy anything other than Heineken's. But in a funny way, it gives you a bit of a badge of honor. I'm like, yeah, I'm so crazy that I'm only allowed a bottle of beer. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yeah. yeah. It's funny. Awesome. I think we've already discussed this with the do it, then it's done. But do you have any quotes or sayings that you live by? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, do it, do it, then it's done. I've explained that. And then, as I said, I'm a huge film and TV fan. And Game of Thrones is a particular love of mine. And Tyrion Lannister and that says a quote a couple of times. And he just says one, one game at a time, one game at a time. Yeah. And that's, that's something I live with every single day. And I say it so many times a day. I, you know, you're feeling a bit overwhelmed or whatever. I'm like, one game at a time. It, they kind of feed into each other. One game at a time and you do that, then it's done. And then it's the next game. And genuinely, I literally had a conversation this morning with someone about this process and how, how I kind of try and live. And, and that's the same when I'm on seasons. You know, I'm like, right, cool. Uh, I've got this morning session and I've, it's on the a simulator on the grass and it's sunny as fuck and I'm hungover and I'm going to do this. Yeah. And then I go, right, and that's what I'm going to do. And then it's And then I've done that and it's done. And... What's the next game to do, you know? And it's funny looking back because at the time I didn't have these quotes and I didn't have this awareness of that was how I was living life. But now looking back, I'm like, that's exactly what I was doing. It just makes everything so much less overwhelming, especially on a season. It can just be sensory overload and you can just burn yourself out so quick. But yeah. again, I've taken that into my, my job now and what I do as well is I try and be really disciplined and just, yeah, whatever it is becomes my singular focus and that's it uh, and then i tick it off one game at a time yeah so yeah i suppose that's it do you have any books movies podcasts or publications which you can recommend to our listeners which have helped you on your journey or can you name something that has inspired you recently well obviously there's a great podcast called the after hours lounge that you should all listen to 100 <laughs> percent. Um, yeah yeah no no you don't well if you want to listen to my podcast that would be lovely but please don't feel like you have to um <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, th this is a really interesting question because when you say like, you know, books, movies, you know, podcasts and stuff, I very much view all that stuff as escapism rather than help. Right. So when I read books, mostly I read books about fucking dragons and starships, you know, like I, yeah, you know, and then movies as well. Like I said, I'm a huge like film, TV, you know, movie fan. I, it's, it's definitely like my medium that I love. Bit of a film buff, I suppose. Again, it. It's not necessarily things that have helped me on my path, but I, I very much view it as escapism. But I suppose that is a way to help um, in a certain way of, you know, realizing that that stuff, not like, you know, putting too much emphasis on it, but it can be therapy in its own way. Like go and sit and watch a movie, just escape from wherever you are for a couple of hours. And I think that's pretty great. Something that takes you off world. I don't mean it needs to be about, you know, going into space, but I mean something that takes you out of where you are right now, I think is so, so, so valuable. Podcasts, again, I'm a bit of a funny one. I, as someone who has a mental health podcast, I find a lot of mental health podcasts a little bit overwhelming. Really? Yeah, and I find there's just so much information and so many opinions that you end up going, oh my God, this is just too much. So I listen to a lot of film podcasts, but there's also one podcast I love is a podcast called Armchair Expert, mm -hmm. which is an actor called Dax Shepard, who used to be a raging alcoholic, drug addict, bit of a bad man. He's married to um, Kristen Bell. He He's just like, he's so honest and open and like, he doesn't care about being vulnerable. And, and he's like 6'4 and stacked and all this, but he's so chilled about like talking about crying and stuff like that. And he, I think he's a bit of an inspiration for me. I, I definitely try and emulate him quite a lot you know, talking about, but he does two episodes a week, one with like a kind of scientist -y person and then one with a, a celebrity. Oh, cool. And they don't just talk about films, you know, they, they just talk about life and how people operate and things like that. And that's a really, a really awesome podcast. Awesome. What's one myth about season air life that you would like to debunk? That it's not a real job. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. it. And that is the myth. There's so many myths of, oh, it's something that you do in your uni summers. No, no it's not. People do it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. People do it for their whole career, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's the myth. Now I've got to ask you my mum's favourite question. What's one thing you take everywhere with you when you travel or do you have any travel hacks? 
the most important thing I take everywhere with me are these little bad boys, headphones. Yeah. Because, you know, I can get a bit cooked quite easily, a bit overwhelmed, things like that. I've got some hearing problems as well. I've got conductive deafness or something. I can't remember what. Anyway, but yeah, um, sometimes the noise and everything just like just fucking overwhelms me and gets a bit much. Mm -hmm. So head headphones are a bit of an essential. I always love having something to escape and listen to, whether it's music or a podcast or a, a book. That's very important. Travel hacks. I don't know, because the, the thing is with season airs, we like to sit there and go, you know, we're travelers and all this. But actually, we don't really do much traveling. <laughs> no. You fly you fly to your resort and you stay there for six months and then you fly home. <laughs> like we don't. That's so true. We don't really travel at all as season airs. <laughs> so, no, I mean, keep your phone charged. Don't lose your passport. Don't keep your wallet and your passport and your phone all in the same bag or pocket. There we go. Yeah, I, I don't know, house. really. <laughs> Smashed it. Yeah. That's what we need. <laughs> there we go. Bang, done, out of the park. Done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mic drop. Overall, what's the biggest lesson learned from living and working abroad? I think just learning how to talk to people from every single walk of life. From five-year-olds to 70-year-olds to people that don't speak a word of English. Everyone, you know. Even things like that, this is always, I love, I do love telling this story. So there was, um, I, I taught a lot of kids for the first couple of years I worked at Club Bass. And one year we had two brothers and one of them, I can never remember the other brother, but we had one guy called, one kid called Alex, who uh, he was actually 18, but he had Down syndrome. So he, he joined in on the kids lessons with us. I'd never worked with anyone with Down syndrome before. I've never had any contact with someone with Down syndrome before. And I'm not going to lie. I went in being like, fuck, this is going to be really difficult. And he wasn't. He's just loud. Like, <laughs> that was it. He was just, he just shouted all the time. Other than that, <laughs> he was just, he was there for the same reason. He was there to have fun. All he wanted to do was enjoy himself. And him and his brother, and I'll never forget, the Friday night party after we, you know, finished the week and stuff, I saw them ordering cans of Coke from the bar. And then they would go down to, like, the bush. They'd pour the can of Coke out on the ground. And then they'd like steal their dad's beer and fill their Coke cans with beer. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, he had Alex and his younger brother. I think, I can't remember his younger brother's name, but he was like 15, 16 and Alex was 18. <laughs> and they were doing that. It just made me realize like, we are literally all just trying to have a good time, aren't we? <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter. And, and I think that was the biggest thing I've learned is to, how to talk to and deal with people. Whether it's an 18 year old kid just looking to try and get drunk with his brother who's got down syndrome or whether it's a 68 year old man who's had a hip replacement, but still wants to keep windsurfing or a five year old Greek girl who doesn't speak a word of English, but I've got to teach her how to windsurf. You just learn how to talk to people and how to make yeah. conversation. And you know, when you finish your season air career and you, you want to try and get a job somewhere and you are just heads above every other candidate, the skills you learn, they can't be overstated. It's invaluable. If you hadn't have gone and done your first season, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Well, I, I was in two minds when I was at school. I was going to go to university and do film and media, or I was going to go and do seasons. And then when I realized that I could not be asked to study for more exams, I went and did, did seasons instead. But at the time as well, my dad had a friend who worked for a company called Endemol, who they're a production company. They did like Big Brother and all the Channel 4 stuff for many years. Okay. And they were going to try and get me a job as like a runner for Endemol. So probably if I hadn't gone and done a season, I'd probably be working in TV and, you know, maybe be quite successful. But I I, I think it's foolish to think like that. Uh, ultimately, that's a, a different Sandy in a parallel universe doing something different. But yeah, he's not sat here talking to you today and he's not traveled <laughs> around the world. You know, is there anyone you would like to nominate to come on the show and have a chat with me? My friend Alex Bruce, who you've listened to, like he does the Global Season Air Network. So the Facebook page where season airs can kind of find jobs, things like that. He's done a lot more seasons all across the board. You know, he's done a lot of winter seasons. He's done the big Nielsen seasons. He's done the little Vasiliki season. He windsurfs. He's sick at snowboarding. He's also worked on super yachts for a while and everything like that. He's just a very interesting man. He's very good to talk to as well. Like I said, he's, he's literally one of, one of my best mates. Um, and mm -hmm. I've had him on the podcast many times. He would be very good to chat to. And then, yeah, my my old boss, uh, the manager of Club Bass, Ollie Scott, is mm -hmm. is a very interesting man to talk to as well. Like he he's done a couple of winter seasons, I think, but just just his 
for, for him, just like his experience of managing people, I think is invaluable. You know, the way the way he goes about managing, you know, he calls it herding kittens, trying to deal with 40, 50 drunk 18 to 22 year olds <laughs> that, that just want to have a good time and shag each other when he's trying to, like, get them to do a job. <laughs> so, yeah, no, he, it, it's really it's really interesting. Obviously, we've talked about the podcast. We need to tell people where to check that out. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram at the After Hours Lounge, and you can listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. There's a few episodes on YouTube which you can watch, but I'm very, very lazy, so I don't really put many of them up there. And also, I hate my face, so I don't like people seeing it. So yeah, but I don't mind you listening to my voice, even Aww. though I hate my voice as well. But yeah, yeah, you can listen on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, please, if you're enjoying it. Put it in your Instagram story. Share it. I'm sure Gina says it's about hers as well. Just share it. Uh, it very much helps and leave a nice little rating as well there's just under 90 episodes now so there's plenty for you to listen to and i've had all sorts of very cool interesting people on and what is one parting piece of advice for anyone thinking about becoming a season heir or starting a new adventure don't listen to all the noise don't ask questions to every single person and try and figure everything out just go and do it you don't need to have the entire adventure and whatever it is everything mapped out you don't need to do that. You can just go and get on a plane, book a flight, go to an interview, get the job, whatever. Going into the unknown is so much more exciting and interesting than scary, if that makes sense. Yeah. It sounds corny, but just enjoy the ride. Everyone likes doing different things. You've got to find your own path, but don't be afraid to go on it. It's better to be on a path than no path at all. So you might, might as well just go and have a go. And ultimately, you can always just come home. You can just get a flight home. If you go out on a season, you get three weeks in and you go, oh, I hate this. Then you can leave. There's no shame in that. I think a lot of people are so afraid to quit something that they never have a go in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, yeah, just just go and do it, you know? Yeah. Awesome, Sandy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to finally meet you as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the podcast ecosystem on Instagram where we all kind of know each other but don't know each other. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very cool. But no, no, thank it you. Is. It's yeah, it's it's been an absolute pleasure. Like I said, it's talking about seasons and stuff. I could do it all day. It's I'm so passionate about it. I think it's such an amazing thing for people to do, and I think it's so important for especially for young people to go and go and do it and get out in the world and learn something. Um, yeah. I think it's I think it's brilliant. I'm very stoked to have been asked to come on because obviously Aww. what you're doing is amazing and getting people getting people you know the knowledge and the wisdom from from old people like us that have done it before <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah no it's been so much fun and uh thanks thanks for coming on i'm stoked to have you on pleasure doesn't get much more insightful than that a huge thank you to the incredible sandy clueless for coming on the last episode of season two as always check the show notes for any links relating to today's show including a link to sandy's podcast the after hours lounge well that's it guys that's a wrap can't believe we're at the end of season two already and what a season it's been thank you to all my amazing guests it's truly been an absolute blast if you're thinking of doing a season or you know someone who is remember to point that person in the direction of the website in the show for information tips and insights into season their life and if this is your first time listening to the show why not head back through our earlier episodes starting with episode one where i chat to the beautiful and talented lauren lamari and head across to Instagram and Facebook. Give us a follow at That Season Air Podcast for all the latest Season Air news straight from resort. Shout out to our sponsors, Gap360. Thanks to Mike at Mike's Sports Bar for the studio space. Thank you to Mondo Wave for the music. And thanks to you guys for tuning in. We'll be back soon. Yeah, yeah. If you uh, if you need to sort out your visa, then go to Gap360. They will help you sort everything out. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you properly now. <laughs>